I'm not Eric, I'm Brian, and this is my plus one, and I'm Eric. Uh, Eric. And we're going to talk about questionnaires and structured data capture. So, what are we going to cover? I'm going to go a little bit over uh, what are we going to use um, questionnaires for? So, what are the common uses? Um, talk about um, what are the fire resources, how they relate to each other. Uh, Eric's going to go through the workflows, how they fit together into the rest of the business flow and what do we do within them and creating them, rendering them and adaptive questionnaires, which is sort of a new topic. And then we'll talk about how do we get stuff into and out of the actual entered questionnaire. So using them afterwards and with time some validation. So let's crack in. So uses of questionnaires. So I'll take um, notes from the audience. It's after the keynotes, you've had lunch, it's settled in a little bit. So what does something that someone wants to do with a questionnaire? Assessments. Assessments. Uh, I've got primary care on there, but good. Uh, number two <laughs> for 10 points. <laughs> Close assessments consumers, but yes, definitely Public government condition. conditions, statutory forms, referrals templates, admission forms, care plans, research, oncology, the list goes on public reporting. And strangely enough, you could even do general data entry um, because it's a pretty generalized bit of infrastructure that you can do anything with. Exactly, so it's, it's not a new space, so it's been well trodden, um, and we've sort of dipped our feet in it as well. So from a fire questionnaire's point of view, um, the primary resource we've got is the questionnaire resource. So which is the definition, uh, which covers the schema, so what data items are we capturing, uh, the layout, how do they look, and validation rules. And also in that we can include um, rules and descriptions on how to extract it from other sources and also how to pull content out of the questionnaire and create other things like creating a, an admission record. So it's really similar to a structure definition where structure definition or profiles define how we're going to record a bit of fire content and so we want to record an encounter or an observation um, whereas the questionnaire allows us to be more abstract. And one of the questions I get is, well, we're gonna create a profile on questionnaire. And the answer is, no, you're gonna create a questionnaire. <laughs> so just be careful on that. Um, so it's gonna have terminologies or value set references. Um, there's sort of a, an option of referencing a value set or having a couple of options in there. Um, and of course, the next part of that is the questionnaire response which is the resource that captures the data that's been entered or collected. And then the other sides is extensions that fit into the space, operations to do the extraction or pre-population. Um, some people go profiles and we'll have implementation guides. So the SDC or structured data capture is the HL7 defined um, advanced questionnaire functionality set. So. In that questionnaire resource itself, we've got a whole set of metadata. So we can know who created it, what's it for, um, the versioning, or that type of information, uh, the context in which it should be used, and then a whole bunch of items, which are the actual questions and groups, which is the, the meat of the questionnaire that people interact with. And among that is link ID, type, items, and then on the questionnaire response side is the context. So if it's a patient um, assessment, then it would be a context of the patient. If you were creating a group assessment, it might be attached to a group. If it was a satisfaction survey for a practitioner, then the context would be a practitioner. And the items are nested. And the link ID is that connection between the questionnaire and the questionnaire response so I can match the things up and they have to match so validation and everything else works um, as you flow forward. So 
This is all the item types. I'm not going to read through them and go this, 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 this. That's what the spec's for. Um, but I will highlight a handful. So sort of in the context of what's sort of been different and changed. So group is sort of your grouper. So you can create tables that are repeating or you can just have a collection of items such as a, a patient section or a practitioner section um, like that. Uh, we used to have a property called label uh, where you could just put some text into a group. Instead, we now just have a display, which is an item that you are not going to try and collect any data for. Uh, and string and text, string sort of your shorter type responses, whereas text is your more free form, expect a, a multi-line style thing. And open choice was sort of the odd one out where the results it can produce or retrieve is a, a coded value um, or a text field. So think about you've got a, a nice little pick list of check boxes and then that one at the bottom that says other, where you go and fill in your text. So that's sort of those. Uh, interacting with terminologies, so which is those um, choice and open choice. Uh, they can be a link back to a terminology um, or being contained and they're always answered with a value coding except with the um, open choice style. Uh, when you're designing your questionnaires, the control selection often matters, um, especially with terminologies. Um, a yes, no terminology, okay, check boxes, yeah, that would work. A drop down, maybe it's not quite as nice, but it could be okay. If I've got 10 values, check boxes is possible, radios might be better, um, a combo is quite practical. Um, if I go and say, okay, um, towns in the USA as a possible set, um, none of those options are good, but an autocomplete style look ahead um, would be a good choice for that. So get your control um, going on there. Um, there's a handful of questionnaires, oh, sorry, extensions that map into that, that can uh, assist there. Um, option exclusive is if you've got a multi-choice set of options, you can say this one is the exclusive, so it must only be this and not others. And of course, when we're doing the rendering style or collecting the data, uh, we're going to use the expand operation from the terminology service to go and get the information. So, uh, those that have been around for a while, um, if you've been playing in the DSTU 2 and 3 space, um, there was groups and questions that went to items. Um, so there was a handful of changes, but probably not a lot of people. Actually, does anyone here, apart from myself, um, played with DSTU 2 of questionnaires? I think that was one. <laughs> Two! There we go. So for both of us, that was the changes. <laughs> so between three and four, um, there were a few minor changes, so not a real huge difference. Um, so a simple transform should be enough to get between, um, specifically around options and value sets. Um, the enable when was changed, and the dollar populate operation disappeared. <laughs> Um, it moved out into the SDC um, implementation guide. So we didn't remove it and make it go away. We don't want it anymore. It's moved into the more complex functionality where we can describe how to do it. Okay, uh, which is sort of the key on, yes, go and look at the SDC implementation guide. Um, that's where we've got um, extensions to those core, core implementation. Um, how advanced rendering can work, um, more advanced form behavior, and getting stuff in and out of those definitions. At which point I shall hand it back to... Okay, so workflow, and I'm gonna also introduce you to the um, Argonaut questionnaire guide, which the way I look at it, the STC guide, take a look at it, but that's more like the graduate level course in, in questionnaires. It does a lot of things, a lot of advanced things. And it's a bit complex. I think we have a more of a middle school guide that we created in Argonaut that does the simple stuff. So we're, I'm gonna focus on that and talk about a couple workflows we describe in there using a simpler form. And then once you understand that, it's easy to jump into the SDC and look at the, the, uh, the more advanced features. So first of all, um, 
in the workflow, we have, um, in a very simple workflow, you, 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 an author or a guide, you store it somewhere, and somebody goes and picks out that guide. They load it up in their, in their, um, in their application and render it, and they grab uh, the responses from a, um, a, a subject who's creating a response or, ask, or, or somebody who's actually recording what the person is, or patient is responding. Um, and then you go ahead and um, you enter the data. There's, there, there's an optional step of validating that on the local end. Um, the, uh, the question and response is then uh, stored somewhere and it may be validated again on that, that storing server. And, um, and, and then it, it's validated and then it's stored on some target servers. And then you can also have another step where you're actually looking for the responses. Maybe you're collecting responses and doing some statistics on them. So you might have a, another step after that. So in the Argonaut Questionnaire Implementation Guide, we've, we've come up with this static form workflow, which is very similar to what I described. And I, I, in nice little pictures, I show it right there. Um, and so in this guide, and we have, I'm going to switch over for a second, see if this works. Look at that. Okay. So in this guide here, um, we created this guide. And this is an SCU3 guide. But like um, Brian said, it should be convertible relatively easily over to um, R4. We, we, we stripped out the use case to very simple static forms. Um, we have some text-based questions, questions, and scoring. And um, it's a basic workflow for discovery, for search, and storing. And so we have these simplified the whole process down. So we have a, a couple actors in here. Let me go back to the actors. Let me call our simple actors. Um, we have a, um, an assessment bank. That's where you grab the questionnaire, you look it up, and you, based on your search criteria, and pick out um, a questionnaire you want to use. And then you render it using some sort of uh, uh, the form filler. We call it the provider EHR in this case. They render it. They record the responses. And then they may want to store that in what we call an answer bank for, for further uh, analysis later on. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so here's that picture I showed before, and it just basically goes through that very simple workflow. You grab a questionnaire, you, you um, render it, you grab the, the response to that questionnaire, and you store that, and maybe for later use, you go and grab some of those, those questionnaires to uh, analyze later on. And then we have another use case we talked about here. Um, so this is, I'm, just, I'm going to skip to the next use case in the interest of time, where we talk about having adaptive form. An adaptive form is a form where your next question, your first question you answer, will de determine the, uh, the following question. So, and in this case, in our, in our guide, we, we describe a stateless adaptive questionnaire. And what happens here, and I'll just describe it, is we start in that little green box we start up there in the corner, um, and you're a form filler. You're the, you're the, uh, the application that wants to re re record the questions. So you, you go out and you, for some, you discover uh, a questionnaire out there, and you go and you ask them for a questionnaire. And you do that, and you consider the adaptive questionnaire service as a black box. You don't care what that does. You're just going to send it a, a request to give me the first question. And then we do that, and then the, the adaptive service quest, questionnaire service will send you the first question. <coughs> you answer that question. You send it back to them. And based on that first question, they give you a next question. And typically, and you think about PROs, your, your questions are, it's limited to like a less than, usually less than a dozen questions. Because based on the first question, they can determine the next question. After that, they get the third question. So each time they iterate through all the questions, they can determine the next question. So you get these, these rather short, interactive questionnaires that are developed that way. And so um, and in both SDC and Argonaut questionnaire, we've, we've, we've come up with a framework to do this through FIRE, where you actually are, tra you're actually exchanging a couple objects. You're exchanging a questionnaire response object. And within, within that, you're building the questionnaire. And I'm going to just show a quick quick um, review of that. I don't think I'm going to get here and, and show how that works. I'm going to switch over. In fact, I'll use this one here. Better refresh this or it's going to time out. So I'm going to take a, uh, a set of questions here. And I'm going to, this is just a little demonstration piece. But it, basically, so basically, you, you, you uh, discover a questionnaire you want to use. 
and then you, you, you fetch it. So you, you go ahead and grab that first questionnaire. And, and in, in, this, in this little demonstration, I have that little box down there below. It shows a contained questionnaire within a questionnaire response. And if you look below here, now the, the links are in your notes when you get them. It just shows the structures below here. But basically what happens is you post to the, the service. It sends you back your first question. And then you answer that question. So we'll check the little box here. And then what happens then, it, that gets updated on, on the client end. And then they send it back to the service. They pick it up. And so what's happening, you're, you're gradually building up your object here. You have a questionnaire response resource. And you're, you're starting to add more content to it. And you're exchanging this back and forth between the two actors. So we'll click it again. Hopefully this, this keeps going here. And then you get another question. And we got another average error. We got, if you know your Monty Python, you'll be able to answer this. You have to look it up on the web, though. It's about 11 meters per second, I believe, for a, a laden swallow. Um, unladen, I think it is, but I got that wrong. So again, what happens is we're starting to build, as you can see, we're starting to build up our, our questionnaire answer res uh, resource. And we're starting to add questionnaires to the questions to the contained questionnaire. And we're starting to fill in the, um, fill in the questions and as, as they get populated, they go back to the service. It looks at that, runs through them all, and determines the next question. So if we, we run through this real quickly, and I'll just go a couple more clicks here. It should end pretty quickly. So it just goes back and forth, back and forth. And then we get this final questionnaire completed. So <clears throat> typically, that's a flow of an adaptive questionnaire. And using the fire resources, we just exchange it back and forth using an operation, and it'll, it'll um, give you the, um, that, that particular workflow. What's that? Yeah. That's the one. OK, and let's see what we got here. OK, creating questionnaires. So, um, there's a, so creating questionnaires, you can do it by getting, get out Notepad++ or Adam, whatever you use, and start you know, typing away in JSON or, or um, XML. I don't recommend that. That's pretty tough. Um, there are several good tools out there. This is an editor of a DSU tool right there, the SmartQ editor. Um, and then the, the National Library of Medicine has built a form builder for LA. It's called LHC Fire Questionnaire, which I've used. And we actually have a, uh, another another talk where we're going to do some activities and, and create our own questionnaires. And I'm going to be walking through how to use that to create some, some forms. Graham has an editor, I believe. Is that true? Yeah, he's Graham. And then there's other editors. Anybody else out here create a, a questionnaire editor for Fire? Any others we don't know about? I didn't do much searching. Did you find any more? Uh, there is at least one other. OK. And the other option, of course, is if you've got your own internal forms builders tools, um, actually creating uh, output generators from your existing stuff. So we had an internal one, and so we essentially produced an export routine that created the forms. So it's, it's another good option for creating. OK, so I, I covered some of this. Fetching questionnaires in the Argonaut Guide, we actually defined some standard search APIs, e.g. by title, publisher, uh, context, that you um, can reference your, your questionnaires in, in from what we call the, the, uh, the assessment bank. Um, <clears throat> again, just to emphasize that you have the link ID that, that um, links each item in a questionnaire to the response. And those must match as well as the structure in your questionnaire. And your questionnaire response must be matched. Um, and then there's also an SDC. Remember, the Argonaut questionnaire. Um, implementation guides middle school, SDCs, graduate school. They do a lot of. Um, uh, add a lot of extensions and guidance regarding advanced rendering of, of the, um, the questionnaire. Scoring is another topic. I didn't, I didn't touch on it, but you can score your questions. In fact, in both guides, they talk about scoring. In the Argonaut guide, we talk about how to define the score for a particular item. I think the actual logic is defined in SDC. I'm not, is that correct? I believe so. How, how to do it, yeah. In, in, in the Argonaut guide, we just talk about, here's a score. You figure out how to use that score as an implementation specific detail. Um, time limits, we talk about time limits. I won't talk about that right now because of time limits. Um, um, and then you post the answer. You fetch the answer using, again, the standard search APIs. But one thing, the reason I have this slide in here is to remind me to tell you that individual responses in a questionnaire um, 
response cannot be individually searched. You can't say, I want to search for, for question response number six or three. So you have to actually use one, you have to actually store the questionnaire response maybe in your database and search it that way. Or we do, uh, for example, a uh, extraction of the data into another fire resource and you can search for individual questions that way. When you want to search by, by patient demographics, which is pretty common when you want to review answers and look for all the females over 30, look at their responses, then you have to sometimes, uh, one, there's several topics of that we talk about in the Argonaut questionnaire about maybe using a patient, contained patient resource to give you just the basic demographics so you can tag your questionnaire responses with patient, pa basic patient demographics. There's a lot of privacy issues there, so it depends how you share that, what, what you can actually share on the patient. But you can't really go directly and look at an individual question in a, in a questionnaire response and search on that individual question. Wrong, wrong screen. <laughs> okay, I think I'm back to you. Did you want to do the demo? Filling questionnaires? I don't think we have time, do we? All right, I don't. let's get forward. So, um, converting and mapping to and from other resources. So we'll start off with converting and reading it. So someone's entered in the form and we've received the questionnaire response and we wanna take that and actually do something with it. Um, we've got, um, from the specs perspective, we've defined three ways to do it. Of course, you can do your own way on top of that. Um, but three is sort of a, an easy, uh, medium and a hard uh, in terms of setting up and using. And of course, it's an easy, limited functionality, medium, got good coverage and hard. Uh, you can basically do whatever you want. Um, so the observation based is really for creating observations. So if you want to do any other sort of resource, um, no good, you've got to use one of the other two options. But if all you're doing is producing uh, observations, um, then on each questionnaire item, um, you could define what SNOMED code or LOINC code um, that's going to be created and extracted into the observation. And I, I made a little demo that we're going to cover in our other talk. What's it called? Let's build. The let's build. Let's build. Let's build talk. I actually have a little demo that demonstrates that. I don't know if there's any. Are there any applications out there that you found that actually implement that? You do um, it in your, yes, yours. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. So we've. So I've implemented the middle option. Um, so. So not the easy one, didn't implement that, go figure. Um, so we implemented a definition-based extraction. Um, so you can use, so every uh, fire resource comes with a structure definition and each of those structure definitions, all of the properties are an element definition. And so I can tag up an item in the questionnaire to say this property um, goes into um, that element definition. So if I'm looking at a, an admission form, and on that form, there's a birth date field. I can actually tag that up with patient dot um, birth date. And so that's how we can fit in there. Um, that'll also work for um, groups. So if I've got my patient admission form and I've got the related contacts, which I've got a list of um, three people's phone numbers in there and their names, I can associate the group item, which collects the information for each one of the contacts. And so I'd tag that up with the uh, patient.contact or patient.telecom, uh, whichever name that is. And then in the questions, so I've got two questions in there. One's the name, the other one's the contact number. I'd actually put the definition of patient.contact.name and patient.contact.number or dot value. And so you can apply that level. Um, the difficulty is you can't do any split or joins, um, minimal calculations to actually produce that. And then finally is the structure map based thing, which uses the fire mapping language. And so there's an extension that you can tag on it and say use this structure map. Um, there was another talk, I think it was earlier today, um, that covered doing that. And I'm not going to go into a demo of that. <laughs> um, is there an application or have you done that? Um, Graham might have yeah, something Graham. to say. <laughs> have you done uh, a structure fire mapping map? structure map between questionnaire responses and stuff? No. So there's a tool that does it, but uh, hasn't been exercised. Yeah. I'll go chase that. So 
So he was dobbing someone in <laughs> to say that. <laughs> Bryn. Bryn. Bryn, okay. Bryn Roads. Yep. So pre-population is the opposite of everything I just talked about and comes in all three flavours as well, um, which is the step of, um, here's the admission form. Um, we don't want you to have to go and fill all 150 fields in when you've already got 75 of them already sitting in your, your primary care system or your GP system or even a patient portal. Um, so let's do a populate operation which goes and grabs all of that stuff and puts it into the form before it's shown to the user. So that way it sort of cuts down the time it's going to take to actually go and work with it. So of course we need a context, so a new source, the mapping, an engine that's going to go and do all this stuff, and <laughs> knowledge of the existing source structures. So if you're going to be able to read something, you need to know what it is to be able to go and read it. So that's um, really the, the key part there. Uh, the current populate options are just like we had with the extract out, extract into, we can use the same three approaches. So which is either the observation based link codes or SNOMED codes, um, Firepath based, so where I can get a query context, I think I, and in fact, each of them. So the observation-based approach, um, it's not very flexible because you've really got, here's a code, grab the value, put it in. Um, you might get some systems that understand it a little better and can actually read out and go, I know that that's the link code for the patient birth date. And because I know the context came in for a specific patient, I can read the value. I still think observations get you 80% of the way there. Most cases. It, it gets you some way. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's really what it is. Um, so there's an extension, the observation link period, which says how far to look back in history to see if there is one of these other observations in the past. So if it's saying I want to get the blood pressure in, so we say we'll only, we're only interested in the last two weeks worth of blood pressures for this particular form because it's relevant, but a different assessment form might say, well, we're actually interested in over the last 12 months. Um, if it was old, it's still fine. So that's what that's good for. And that's a nice example um, of one. I wonder, yep. So we can see we've got that link period to say, look for three months. And we want to grab the body weight into the first question and it's the weight that was measured when they were dry in kilograms, and that's the pounds, is it? Pounds. Pounds, yep. Yep, so that's an example. And so that would be the query that the actual pre-populate routine would go and generate to actually perform that operation. So is, the, there, a, is there a wet body weight? I've never seen a dry versus wet, I'm wondering what wet means, so. <laughs> you got out of the pool, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so pre-population from a fire path perspective. So uh, you need, once again, you need the context to come in. Um, so there's a, an expression to say, this is the launch context, which is a bundle, which has a set of search expressions in it. And so the, the populate engine goes and reads that evaluates all of those and produces a bundle of bundles, so which is a bundle for each one of those queries, and then that's passed to the rest of the engine to actually walk through each of those items, and then it goes and uses Firepath to extract the value out of that bundle that you've just received. So which is really quite neat. And you've done that? And I've done a variation on this, um, and yeah, it works really quite well. Have you done the observation one too? No. That's the one I haven't done. So that's cool. Um, and you can use um, expressions in there. So if you wanted to um, do some calculations based on some of the contact content that you extracted. Um, so you could calculate an average between some content that came in. Uh, you could get the first and the last because um, it's all Firepath related. So quite powerful. So which then brings us down to validation. Um, so 
validation sort of with fire works in several stages. And so we've got at the very base uh, for you to actually pass it across and validate this object, you need to transfer it to the server. So you're gonna get validation on the XML or JSON serialization. So you got that level and you go, oh great. It's well structured, it's formatted, um, it's good. So then it goes through the core profile validation. Go, do you have all the mandatory fields? Are the types correct? Um, do you have appropriate invariants done? Coding, right? Codings, all of that stuff. And then you start wandering into the questionnaire response validation, which where it'll actually go and grab the questionnaire definition that matches the response that you've given. And it goes, okay, are the item types based on the same questions? So that's all good. Um, the extensions, the minimum values, maximum values, exclusives, um, and the other areas of that. Then we can walk into custom validation. So there's an extension for invariance, which allows you to um, check complex cross-field validations or conditional mandatory style, which I'll just step into in a sec. And the outcome is, as with all other fire validation, an operation outcome that shows you what's going on. So that last advanced validation essentially is the same technique that we use in the core with structure definitions, but has been ported and is now an extension set in the questionnaire as well. So we have a key, which is the same as the key in the normal structure definition, um, some requirements, which is just useful for designers, the severity, which is either gonna be a warning or an error, the expression, which is the fire path to evaluate, what the message is that you're going to show to the user, and the list, so that's a multi-cardinality, of locations. So where is this issue going on? And then I've got um, one example just to quickly show if I'm on the right screen. Which way am I going? That one and that way. Cool. So just to show an example of this, exp so business rule AO1, it's an error, giant expression, which is quite complex. And we've got, in this particular case, there's two locations because we're comparing two fields to say, if this field's entered in, then this one must also be entered in. So it's sort of a conditional, it's mandatory, but only if the other one's there. So that's one example. Another one here is just a warning, which is an expression for that particular question to say the answer, which is a date, has to be less than today. So which is sort of using that calculation technique. And then one more, now scroll down. So we can even put it on the item itself. So rather than just at the top, we can put it at whichever item makes sense. And what's our expression on this one? So oh, it's a simpler version of the same one. So, and just while I'm here, so here's an example of that extract. So the initial expression, so the worker's family name is patient.name.family.first. So actually that's the expression to pull that bit of data out. And is that the spot? Yep. So I think that's sort of... So, so I had one question if I can ask mm -hmm. about the validation, because I, I go to the structure validation, I stop there. You did the next step where you take mm -hmm. and validate against the questionnaire. What creates, what, are the rules generated by the tooling? The, how does um, that work for the validation, the questionnaire validating the questionnaire response? So it's implemented in my server. Okay. So I've implemented that. Um, the rules are quite similar to the same stuff that we've got with structure definitions. Okay. So it's really the same sort of thing. So there's min values, max values. Um, so so all does the, it just take the questionnaire definition, which is a definition, and yep. it just takes that and applies it to the questionnaire response to create? Essentially, yes. Is that, is that a inbred, is that built into the fire spec or is that something you've, you've implemented? Um, I guess it's described by the fire spec, okay. but is... Um, I'm looking at Graham, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, they're like, that's the expectation. Okay. Right. So yeah. So which I guess that's sort of where we've wandered to. And 
Anyone else got questions? Surely, yep. It's always a questionnaire response that you're passing back and forth. That's the main object. You contain the questionnaire inside it. So it's just, just passing back and forth the questionnaire response. Yeah, so in the end, on the fire server, are you going to have an, a different questionnaire response resource for every single one of these adaptive attempts? When you say the server, the, 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 we'll talk about the client, the one that's asking the questions. No, the client is asking the question. It's getting the structured form from someplace. Yeah. on the server, uh, and then a next question structured form goes out. I don't it's, they don't remember it. They read it each time anew. They, yeah, I'm just talking yeah. about the client. I'm okay, okay. It's on the server. Okay. I mean, it, this adaptive structure sounds to me like when it's all over at the source, the server, not the client. The client's got nothing at the end. Mm -hmm. It's all gone. But in the end, every time he's answered a question or she's answered a question, you've had a new structured I mean, a questionnaire response resource mm -hmm. been created by the client. Now that's sitting on the server. So if you've got 100 questions, you've got 100 questionnaire responses, all small, but... Well, you've got 100 questionnaire responses that have been created and transacted right, yeah. between, so and I would have expected on the server side that those would become versions of that same questionnaire response. That's one way to do it, yeah. So you it's could, sort of like an update, update, yeah. update, and so it just gets bigger and bigger. It's, yes, it's different questions, but it's, it's appended onto the same response. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So you end up at the end where you've got, um, you had 20 questions that were asked and answered. Yeah. And so that questionnaire response at the end has 20 answers in the one questionnaire response. And typically Does this that makes sense? Yep. Okay. And you typically, for this type of form, you don't have that many questions, less than a dozen usually. So you're not looking at 100 questions. You wouldn't want to do this for 100 questions either. The idea is to strip out all the irrelevant questions, just focus on the questions that you need. And that's why they tend to be short. But you're right. Versioning, if you want, you could save all, all of the versions. You could save them individually and each time on the client end. I mean, as far as we define it, it's a black box out there that's giving you the questions. So you don't know what they're doing. They just. I have another question. Yeah, okay. I guess one more note with that, they don't have to be one question, it might be a little panel. So yeah, here's exactly. five questions that we need to collect and go, okay, yeah, that all makes sense and then flow on to the next panel. But this is more a work of a special engine that's making life easier for someone. Yep. Yep. An example would be the promise form that Northwestern has an engine that does that. Yeah. That's what I mean. So the, the dollar populate that was there in two and possibly three, I don't remember, um, that was more your XPath based thing for C, um, CCDA, wasn't it? Or am I way off on track? Yeah, sorry, I don't have the, the background on that particular area. But you referenced your slides, dollar sign populate, the definition was moved from um, the core spec into the SDC guide where it was actually given the description on how to implement it. Whereas the original one, I believe, said, this is what you have to do, but we're not going to tell you how to do it. I think that was more around what was there. This is hard to find. <laughs> My question is, where do you find SDC? I'm looking for it and I'll see it in there. I had it open if you wanted it. 
Yeah, here, put it back in yours. Yep. So if you want to know where the STC guide is located, he's going to pop it up here. I don't think we put it in our notes because I can't find it off the... So where are we? STC spec questionnaire populate. So this is the current. So it goes through the full population, the choice, context, the caveats. Uh, populate was the one we were looking at. Do, do, do. So we add in. Content. Whereas if I roll back to HL7 dot org slash fire slash stu3 slash and go to populate here. Yeah, so these may be fire resources or binaries with CDA documents or other materials. But there really wasn't a whole lot of guidance. Um, there was concept map was one of the ways that was suggested could be used, um, which is what turned into the structure map model. Um, but yeah, I didn't have a go at implementing that section. So, and I just want to say it at the at the 440, we're going to have a let's build questionnaire session that's going to be, where's that going to be? St. Helena, St. Helens. St. Helens. Yeah. So there was one other question. Yep. Yep. That's exactly the same structure, just contained. Uh, whatever they're doing on the black box, we don't really care uh, what they're doing. So it's just sort of however they want to represent that and they'll just contain it and then reference it within itself. So one of the things I would expect is that the questionnaire or that one would actually have all of the questions that they've already answered will be in there as well, um, but quite possibly have them tagged as hidden so that they're not being shown to the user so they don't have to see all that stuff but it's still there as it goes back and forwards. Does that make sense? Yep. Cool. And one last question. I think we're at time-ish. Yep, okay, so the question was, is, is that conditional behavior that we've just been talking about, that is all on the server, so what's on the client side? Um, so there is enable when capabilities, which we didn't sort of talk about. Go your side here. Am I on yours or mine? Yours now. Yeah, so that there is a level of that. Uh, go the right way. So questionnaire. So the area that really covers a lot of that functionality is the enable when, so you can hide and show um, subsets of information. So if they answer this question to say, um, yes, I have this condition or the review happened, then show these other fields um, that then need to be answered. So that's where a lot of that functionality and certainly where a lot of the forms I've been involved with, they tend to do that rather than trying to do uh, back and forwards adaptive. I've just got a whole series of different panels that are all set up and just show them at the appropriate time rather than do this conversation back and yeah, forth. Yeah, that's kind of the analogy. The enable when you don't use that adaptive because you're, that's what yeah. you're doing, you're going back and forth with yeah. it. Yeah. The adaptive is doing it for you. Yeah, yeah. the server's doing all the decision, the logic over there. It may be, for example, in the case of promise forms, that's all proprietary, so you don't even see that. They just give you the next question. Yeah. yeah. Like ourselves, we have to accommodate That's right. So yeah, so use the enable when to cover the majority of those sort of functionalities. Cool. Well, if there's any more questions, uh, we'll be at the Let's Build questionnaires later on this afternoon um, in 
St. Helens or whatever it was. Yeah, St. Helens. Thank you. St. Helens.